From Washington, D.C. to down the street, the opioid crisis is impacting families around the country and right here in our own communities. I'm Stephanie Gorin. And I'm Brian Collar, and it's a tough but important conversation to have. We recently asked our Facebook followers, has the opioid epidemic impacted your life? Responses came pouring in. You're seeing some of the responses on your screen right now. Honest and heartbreaking comments about personal addiction, family members who are suffering, or loved ones lost. And across our region, these honest conversations have been going on for the past few months through community forums, opportunities for people to come out and share their own experiences in the hopes of helping others from falling down the same path. It's also an effort to educate and spark change starting here at home. We need to start telling, talking and educating our children or we will lose the next generation. In April, nearly 1,000 people packed the Strand Theater in Plattsburgh to hear powerful messages from those directly impacted by heroin. We are not going to be able to save everybody's life. Um, I do promise you, though, uh, from somebody who's been there, that it means the world to me that you helped to save mine. Attendees heard from a former addict and a mother and daughter who spoke of the loss of their son and brother who had died from an overdose. The following month in South Burlington, police explained many of their calls for theft, robbery and shoplifting are linked to feeding and addiction. And experts told parents, talk to your kids early and often. For whatever reason, they don't want to go out and reach out for help. They're seeing the signs. Um, but I think all of you being here today is really good so that your knowledge is power. And in Rutland, some signs of optimism. We have seen a great reduction in folks um, who are using opioids um, and really are showing some improvements in their life in terms of abstinence from opioids, um, improving family relationships, employment, um, going back and getting more education. But fighting the stigma of substance abuse and addiction is an ongoing battle for many. You know, it's not about a moral thing or it's not about willpower. And that fight was made all the more difficult in February when Maple Leaf closed its treatment centers in Underhill and Colchester, leaving patients in a lurch. Our clients are human beings. Many of them, as a result of their pathological or problematic relationship with addiction, have done some bad things. But at their core, they're human beings who are hurting terribly. In response, Vermont's two residential dr drug treatment centers expanded the number of beds available for patients. Valley Vista has a new 19-bed program in Virgins and a 72-bed facility in Bradford. Recovery House Network in Rutland County now has 34 beds between two facilities. But as NBC5's Rachel Cars reports, it can be a struggle to keep up with the demand. The numbers tell the story. 112 Vermonters died in opioid-related deaths in 2016. That number is the highest it's ever been. But as the number of deaths goes up, the state has improved some of the wait times for treatment in the hub and spoke system. Data from the Vermont Department of Health shows there were more than 3,100 people in treatment in one of the state's hubs in July. That same month, 110 people were waiting for treatment. Since January of 2014, that number has been as high as 615. But wait lists vary by region. This data shows the number of people waiting for hub services is the highest in the state's northwest region, though that number has continued to fall. But what about this year? The state released preliminary data for the first five months of 2017. From January to May, 42 Vermonters died in opioid-related deaths. While that number is expected to go up, the state added a new hub this summer in St. Albans. The temporary location is currently serving 150 people. State officials plan to open the permanent location later this month. Rachel Cars, NBC5 News. If you or a loved one needs treatment, there are resources available to you. You can call 211 or head to the health department's website, healthvermont.gov. We've posted a link in the state of addiction section of mynbc5.com. 
Local leaders agree access to help for those in need is the number one challenge. Several key players in Chittenden County have been working together in an effort to streamline that process. The group sifts through drug arrests looking for repeat offenders. The police log often serves as a roadmap of someone's struggle with addiction and crime. Sitting at one table, the members can find common threads and connect people with the help they need. It allows us to find the common threads, people who are appearing on our radar uh, as users or in need or committing crimes in different jurisdictions, and figure out um, um, how to, you know, how to get them the help they need. The Burlington Police Department also hired a coordinator for opioid policy and response. This comes as Chittenden County State's Attorney Sarah George is leading a committee researching whether Burlington should have a center where heroin users can shoot up. The center would be staffed by someone trained to recognize the signs of an overdose and who could offer help in case of one. George says similar centers have been successful in reducing deadly overdoses. Just because they work elsewhere does not mean that they will work here. We do not currently know whether safe injection sites will work in Chittenden County, but not knowing or not understanding does not mean that we don't talk about it or have a conversation about it. That's George said she won't fully support the concept unless she's convinced it'll save lives and that Burlington has the resources to operate one. Across our region, prescription rules are in place designed to reduce the number of people who become addicted to the drugs. In New Hampshire, doctors have to complete a risk assessment for patients, and patients must sign a consent form. In Vermont, there is a limit of 12 pills at a time, and a Narcan prescription is required if the prescription is over a certain dosage. In New York, prescriptions for acute pain are limited to a seven-day supply. Um, ultimately, we'd like. Meanwhile, the UVM Health Network CVPH has free Narcan kits for patients in the emergency room. Officials say the kits are provided with the help of state funding. If you want a kit, you have to be a registered patient in the hospital or a family member of a patient. There are also other options available, including meeting with a substance abuse counselor. Hospital staff tell us they see at least one overdose per day. going in and the caretaker of the child is um, is high on heroin at the time, unable to care for the child at the time. They have no resources available. We'll remove the child right then. They are some of the youngest victims of the opiate crisis. How you can help kids in our region while their parents try to get clean. State of Addiction on NBC5 is sponsored by Parent Up Vermont. Thursdays. Are you a pirate? Well, welcome to Shiver Be Tinder. It's Improverific. This town ain't big enough for two Santa Clauses. And Improvulous. Things you can say about America that you can't say about your partner. It's so big with so many ports of entry. Whose line is it anyway? Brought to you in part by Martin, Harding, and Mazzotti, the heavy hitters. Injured? Call 1-800-LAW-1010. It's not just a donation. It's a warm blanket. It's a bottle of clean water. It's a roof and a bed. It's knowing someone cares. It's feeling safe. He said today that's better than yesterday. Every dollar you can spare helps so much more than you can imagine. Please donate now to help people affected by Hurricane Harvey. Your support is urgently needed. Continuing our in-depth look into the state of addiction with some of the youngest victims in our region, kids and teenagers whose parents are suffering from addiction. And because of that, the kids need a new safe place to stay. NBC5's Leanne Denyer is here to explain this ripple effect of the opioid crisis. So often when we talk about the opioid problem, we pull up numbers, facts, and figures. But at the core of this issue is the families. Families being pulled apart. We met a northern New York mother who knows this cycle firsthand. This is Heather Cosgrove and her son Addison. Cosgrove tells us that she abused opiates first. She moved on to heroin and then meth. Cosgrove says she came home high to child protective service workers on her doorstep, ready to take her children away. 
there was another on my doorstep. I'm just waiting for me. And it tore me up inside so bad that I can't even put into words. And then I went out and wanted to be dead. I didn't care. I just wanted to, to die. I feel like a goal that's reasonable is having a relationship again. Like once I start college, like at least visiting her. Because I feel like she needs that motivation too. And that strive to know that her son's doing well so she can do well too. So Addison tells us that he knows that the foster care system has its challenges, but overall he says he's very thankful for the opportunities that it has provided to him. He's got his sights set on college and he and his mom are working on rebuilding their relationship. And Leanne, there are resources in place to help foster foster kids rebuild relationships and navigate the challenges they're facing, right? Yeah, certainly the foster parents are very much involved in this process. They're expected to work with the biological families, you know, when the when the time is right. The Clinton County Social Services tells us that sometimes if they come in and a parent is high, unable to look after their children at the time, they can remove a child right there even before contacting family court. This is why there is such an urgent need for foster care foster parents right now. But we're looking for people that pretty much open their hearts and, and you know, be a resource to these children and, and be understanding, but still apply rules, you know, that you would as a, a parent. Um, a big thing is that we they, they need to be working with us as a team. The idea here is to get the children into a permanent home as soon as possible. The opiate crisis has drastically increased the need for foster homes, specifically for sibling groups, older children, and teenagers. New Yorkers who are interested in becoming a foster parent must take this course. It's called the MAP training course. We stopped by one of these emotionally charged classes. Their participants learn about a range of topics from child development to how to show love to a troubled child. Foster parents must be at least 21 years old, in good health, and with sufficient income. If you are interested in becoming a foster parent, contact your county Department of Social Services. And we should also note, if you're looking for tips for talking to your kids about any of the topics we've discussed tonight, head to the Parent Up Vermont website for advice. We've got links to both on the MyNBC5 mobile app and MyNBC5.com. We also have a list of local resources posted, self-help groups, as well as support and treatment services, and how to get in touch with them. We've also posted a map of drug drops locations across our region. It's all on the MyNBC5 mobile app and MyNBC5.com.